that is a great message for all of us to uh, keep in mind. Get very careful with that guitar. I wonder how many of you guys here, not females, but guys, had a brother that you sort of grew up with. How many of you had a brother when you were growing up? <clears throat> Raise your hands. Yeah, a lot of us. Now, today there are lots of famous brothers. For instance, in sports, there was, you know, Peyton Manning and Eli Manning. In basketball, there was Mark and Pau Casal. In boxing, there's these two Russian guys whose names I cannot pronounce. There are brothers in acting, like all the Baldwin brothers, and then there's the Wayne brothers, and there's the Affleck brothers, and most importantly, the Howard brothers, you know, the Three Stooges. In music, there's Barry Robin and Maurice Gibbs, you know, the Bee Gees. There's a, some guys called the jo Jonas brothers, I've heard of it, but I, I don't know anything about their music. And then there's the Blues brothers, who I don't think are physical brothers, but you know, they're brothers. Well, today we're in week two of our series about the entourage, and while Jesus' disciples were sort of a band of brothers, some of them were actual brothers, like Peter and Andrew were brothers, James and John were brothers, and the least known of the sets of brothers are Jude and James. Now, if you weren't here last Sunday, the basic idea behind this series is to look at the 12 disciples that Jesus personally hand-selected to be his inner circle and kind of find out why, how regular, how ordinary they were. Some were fishermen, others were tax collectors, some were manual laborers. Not one of them was a renowned scholar, not one of them was a theologian, not one of them had any political power or influence. They were total outsiders to the religious establishment of Jesus' day. They don't appear to have any special intellect or talent that made them stand out in any way. They were, on the other hand, prone to mistakes, lapses of judgment, and slow to learn. Even Jesus remarked on several occasions, you guys aren't real quick to catch on to everything. He would say that. So they were not the three stooges, not the 12 stooges. They were the disciples, though. The word disciple means learners, and they all started out as really rough around the edges, learners of Jesus' way. They ended up being messengers, and that's where we get the word apostle. They first learned, then they were sent out as Jesus' messengers. But why did Jesus pick? Why did he choose out of the thousands and thousands of people that were thronging to hear him and they followed him? Why did he pick them? I mean, he would be entrusting the most important mission in human history to these 12 men after he was gone. And there was no plan B, right? I mean, if they, if they failed, if they screwed it up, the eternal consequences for humankind were just literally unimaginable. And yet, like I said, Jesus did not pick from among the religious leaders of his day, no rabbis, no priests, no Pharisees, but instead chose flawed unskilled, unrefined, unremarkable, ordinary people. The last week we started with Peter, who is undoubtedly the leader and the most well-known of all of the 12. Today I want to look at a couple of the least known of Jesus' disciples. The first one is named Jude. He was sometimes referred to as Judas, but Judas, son of James, to differentiate from being Judas, the one who betrayed him, that was important. It's like, hey, Judas, son of James, all right? Not Judas, who betrayed Jesus. He also had the nickname Thaddeus, which in the Greek language in the New Testament was originally written in, it means mama's boy. I just thought that was so weird. I mean, most people eventually outgrow the nickname mama's boy, but apparently not Jude. Even as a grown adult, they, they referred to him as mama's boy. Now, something that's kind of interesting and surprising about the 12 disciples of Jesus is that many of them had nicknames, some of whom uh, were introduced by Jesus himself. And I think using nicknames is kind of more of a guy thing than it is a girl thing. But uh, there are some, like, you know, Kevin Durant, some in the media tried to create nicknames like Durantula, the Slim Reaper, he says he prefers KD. 
Some of you will remember this guy, all right? What's his nickname? A.D. As it stand all day, he's going to be running over you all day long. That's what it meant. How about this guy? You remember what his nickname was? Larry Legend and also uh, the, the, the Hick from French Lick. Maybe you have recognized this next guy, William Perry for the Chicago Bulls. His nickname was what? Yeah, the refrigerator. This uh, basketball player played for the Houston Rockets. He was called Akeem the Dream. Most of you will recognize this guy. He has the same nickname that Jana does at OU, Dr. J. This guy played basketball uh, in college at a small college in Oklahoma, and Jana was in college at East Central and Ada when they played, and they called him back then the Worm, right? You ever heard that name, the nickname the Worm? Uh, a little better nickname is Air Jordan. That's a lot better than the Worm, I think. Uh, some of us are old enough to remember this guy, uh, Broadway Joe. Does he have a mask on? Oh, there it is. Okay, what's that? What is that? Uh, how about this guy? Anybody remember this guy? Pistol Pete Maravich, because he shot all the time. Irvin Johnson was called Magic Johnson. Now, just out of curiosity, I wonder if some of you here had a nickname growing up, and if you would be willing to share what that nickname is and maybe how or why that came about. Anybody here have a nickname that, uh, that you had growing up by, from your family or your friends? Yeah, Sarah. Get. So they called you Gaby Baby. All right. That's better than some, buddy. Proof of that. Jews were more behind the scenes type of servants. Remember last week I said that some of you well to Peter because you kind of have an outgoing personality or you're kind of uh, or you're kind of a leader and some of you kind of resonate with sort of your person but we said that some of you might better identify some of the more more reserved disciples because you prefer to be in the background as opposed to in the spotlight in fact most Believers are primarily behind-the-scenes servants. I mean, there's only so much room in the spotlight for so many people, and the bulk of the work of God's kingdom takes place out of people who are kind of behind-the-scenes secret servants. You know, when you think about it, there's sort of a progression that is supposed to take place. Uh, first, a person becomes a convert, and they say, Jesus. I want to, and that then turns to number two, a follower. So I want to follow in his footsteps. Next day, for the cause of Christ. That's sort of the progression that's supposed to happen over time. But here's what I in the lives of a lot of behind the scenes people like Jude and James and to talk in front of a musical instrument. I just, I don't feel like I have anything to offer. But you do. You absolutely do. And I want to try to convince every single believer to be a vital part like Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. And these passages state unmistakably that God's different for the kingdom of God. For each one Whatever spiritual is administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone he should do it on speaking the very words of God. If anyone who serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Now, from this couple of verses here, I want to point out four insights into the plan of God. Number one is every believer has been given one or more spiritual gifts. That's made clear in verse 10. In other words, there is no such thing as a giftless Christian. Spiritual gifts that the Bible mentions are, are things like the gift of mercy. You know, some people can see a tragic situation and just kind of go, oh gosh, you know, bad luck for those guys. 
And other people, boy, their heart just goes out to that person. They have the gift of mercy. They're just, they can't help but feel compassion for people. And that's a gift. There are those who have the gift of leadership, and they can, you know, help make things happen that are good for, for believers. There are those who have the gift of encouragement. And they just say a, a kind word or an encouraging word every chance they get just to kind of make people feel better and to build people up. There's the gift of giving. There's the gift of teaching. There's the gift of hospitality. There's the gift of helps, which is just, you know, we're moving and getting ready for a potluck. And some people are just kind of sitting there enjoying it. And other people, like, they see the help is needed and they jump up and start helping. That's kind of how you know when you have that gift. Insight number two is that we were given those gifts and abilities to serve others. Verse 10 says that we're to use whatever spiritual gifts that we have received to serve others. Number three, this is found in the middle of verse 11, is that all of us are to serve not in our own strength, but in the strength of God. And in other words, our gifts and talents become empowered when we serve unto God and unto the Lord in the strength of the Lord. And the fourth insight at the end of verse 11 is that we honor God when we use our spiritual gifts and talents to serve others. So here's God's plan. He designed the church to work in such a way that if everyone would discover and then use their special God-given gifts, talents, and abilities, everything would get done, everybody would be helped, and the church would fulfill its purpose and mission. Now, if there isn't 100% participation, obviously the plan begins to break down. You've got gaps. You've got missing pieces in the puzzle. It's like it causes the church to sort of limp along like a car, you know, with only, only three tires or whatever. And the parts that are working quickly um, overcompensate, kind of wear out. However, when there's 100% participation or really close to it, each person knowing and doing their special part, then the sky's the limit because the church is functioning as God designed it to. And that's the plan of God. Not a one-person show, but rather a team. And we serve an equal opportunity God, regardless of your age, your gender, your skin color, regardless of what your background is, good or bad, mistakes you've made, wonderful things you've done, whatever it is, God can use you to be a difference maker in his work, if you'll let him. Recently, I came across a nationwide survey which showed that less than 20% of those who identified themselves as committed Christians serve God in any meaningful or ongoing capacity, less than 20%. And there are lots of reasons. Some people like, uh, I'm too busy, or I'm just not talented. You know, what could somebody like me do? Or I wouldn't know where to get started or how to do it. And there's things that, that could be you know, those things could all be a reason. And there are some that maybe Jude or James would have come up with. Like, hey, we're not spotlight guys. I mean, our nicknames are mama's boy and little guy for crying out loud. Well, how could God possibly use us? Well, I hope that the examples of Jude and James make it clear to all of us today that God loves behind-the-scenes servants. There are many things that you can do Maybe it's not on the stage, or maybe it's not seen by a lot of people. You can make a difference with the kingdom of God. And not just here in our church, but in your workplace, at your school, with your friends, of course, certainly with your family. And just as Jesus called Jude and James to follow him and to learn more and more and then eventually become difference makers, he is also calling you to do the same. Now, of course, many of you have already signed up. You've kind of already figured it out. You've worked on this in the past, and you have a pretty good idea of God uses me, I think, in this way or that way or in this situation in that situation, and you're doing your part for God's kingdom. And so today, I just want to commend you. I want to, I want to cheer you on. Hebrews 6, verse 10 says, God will not forget your work and the love you have shown for him as you have helped people and continue to help others. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, No air of strength on the behalf of someone who's struggling, going out of your way to help someone who needs a hand. None of it ever goes unnoticed by your heavenly Father. Every single act of selflessness and servanthood is noticed, and every single act 
of selflessness and servanthood will be rewarded. Now, just exactly how God's heavenly reward system operates, it's going to be a bit of a surprise, but rest assured that whatever uh, the rewards are, and 1 Corinthians 2.9 says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind can even conceive of what God has prepared for those who love him. Whatever the rewards are, they're going to be beyond your wildest imagination. And so today I want to just say to all of you who maybe feel like Jude, maybe feel like James, like, oh, you know, what could I do? You know, maybe you've been doubted in your life or, you know, marginalized or whatever. You can do. You understand and can discover your spiritual gifts, what they are, and can begin to try to experiment. But maybe God could use me in this situation. Maybe God could use me in that situation. And many of you already know God is using you in different situations through your giving, through your talents, through taking advantage of opportunities, by inviting people to keep it up. All right, let's have our closing prayer. Why don't we stand up?